Welcome to Dow Deep Dives, where we interview Dow founders, core Dow contributors, and everyone else who works on the periphery of decentralized autonomous organizations. Very good. Yeah, so welcome again. I'm stoked to have you on the show, John and Aaron uh, from Eli 5 Dow. Quite interesting, I think, a very interesting model you guys are pursuing as far as I know. We did a little bit of our research, but we always try to learn from you guys on the show for ourselves as well as for our listeners. So welcome. How's it going? Going great. Thanks yeah. for having us. <laughs> Sorry, you got two of us that were like, who talks first? We should be good at this by now. But we're, <laughs> no, thanks for having us. We're super excited to be here. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I think it would just be awesome to introduce yourselves. Either of you could go first or just one of you could explain both. It's completely up to you. But yeah, just for our <laughs> listeners' sake, who are you? Yeah, so I'm Erin on Twitter. I am at Decentra Diary, the Decentralized Diary. And I have been in the Web3 space for almost a year and a half now. I, in my previous life, was an occupational therapist for a decade and then needed a change. So I jumped in to this world because John came up with a project not related to Eli 5 DAO, but the list of DAOs, and it took off. So we decided to see what we could do with that thing. We created the Decentralist.com, which is, has a suite of sites on it now. And then we launched, decided to launch Eli 5 DAO back in November of 2022. So it's almost been a year because through our work with our other project, we found that there was a huge need for like tooling explanations. And we'd have people coming up to us asking, what do you suggest for this or that for my project? So we just found this kind of need and decided to to go for it. Yeah. And uh, I go by John E under like a couple underscores under my name, but most people probably know me for a list of DAOs. That was my first project when I started. And it just blew up. I was reaching out to DAOs and I saw the space as just like all over the place. So I wanted to almost do some organ organization of it. I'm by nature, my, my grad degree is in organizational leadership. So that's what I do for my real job real. But I saw the space and all these DAOs were like all over the place. So I was like, man, if I could just have a simple directory, I didn't know, I didn't want to know how much money was in the treasury or anything like that. I just wanted to know what the mission of the DAOs was and to be like, okay, I vibe with this DAO or like I vibe with their mission and I actually want to join it. And I just wanted a simple like site to do that. So I'm like, all right, I'm just going to do this and see what comes of it. And it just blew up. Speaking of vibing, you two obviously are, are vibing. So which Discord did you meet at? <laughs> so we've been together for almost 20 years, IRL. So we're partners in real life and online. Luckily for us, it works pretty well. We work well together and haven't gotten divorced yet. So right. knock on wood. No. But yeah, so we obviously have known each other for a long time. And obviously we're together here in the same place. So yeah. makes it easy. <laughs> I think this is the first time we have two guests, which are not on two cameras actually on the show. Excellent. So we know who you are and we ask all our guests of their definition of a DAO. So we're just wondering, what do you think a DAO is? So I'll go first. My like Eli 5 that I give people, the Eli 5, just for, I know we're probably going to dive into this a little deeper, is explain it like I'm five years old, is I explain it to people as like cooperatives that use blockchain technology to essentially make decision making. What I think the more abstract of this is I guess one word would say like democracy. It's like putting the power back in people's hands. It's giving them the authority to vote on decisions and do this autonomously using technology of, of today. So that's like my Eli 5 and what I think a DAO is. Are there a lot of examples of DAOs right now? For sure. I think we'll dive into a little bit of like our stack that we use for our DAO. Some people might call themselves a DAO and maybe they're not like using blockchain technology or maybe they're not using certain cases, but we try not to like be the people that like define what a DAO is. We just, if people want to say are calling themselves a DAO, then that's what it is, but it's okay. We want to see this uh, space evolve a little bit. And that's my answer. <laughs> Yeah, I think one of the tricky things in the DAO space right now is there's not a great definition. So people don't know what mm. to call themselves or there there's a lot of extremes where, you know, two projects or groups of people are calling themselves a DAO, but they have nothing in common. Um, mm. So I think there's a few things that should be in place if you're calling yourself a DAO. Obviously, decentralization or working towards decentralization mm. is super important. So like John was saying, where there's a true democracy at hand where everybody has governance or saying governance and things like that. The autonomous piece, 
that's tricky, but I do believe that DAO should be operating on chain in some capacity. So I think that's a tricky one to call yourself a DAO if you're not doing that. But I'm again, we're not the authoritarians here to decide who is a DAO and who's not. And then I also feel like there needs to be some kind of unifying, a unifying mission and mm -hmm. vision for the project. It's easy to get a group together and lose your way, but having that guiding light or that path forward, or in the words of our Lisa Walken, having that lighthouse in the distance to ever, for everyone to steer their boats towards is important. Very good. So what is Eli 5 DAO? I hope, <laughs> I, I hope you're going to live some of those definitions you're, you're laying out. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll get into that. Um, but yeah, give our listeners kind of the elevator pitch of uh, Eli 5, explain it in five, right? Um, and yeah. why are you doing this? Yeah, so uh, Eli5, uh, like I said before, stands for explain it like I'm five years old. And I think Eli5 is about vulnerability at the heart of it. It's we don't care if you have the technical background or if you do have the technical background, anybody that's interested in learning about these tools that can be used for decentralized communities, we want to learn about those and get our hands dirty, almost test them. Uh, test these tools out and try to break them. That's what we uh, try to do. Our first tool that we uh, tested was Colony, and we just went in there and, and tried to break it. A good comparison is like the consumer reports of Web3, where they go out and these, they buy these products and they test them out, and it's for the good of the community and it's for education, and they write reviews on it. That's essentially what Eli5 is doing. Let's walk through that process like a little bit with mm. how you actually go about reviewing something. Like, What is it I'm trying to break this look like? Yeah, I think it's dependent on the tool that we're testing. So the general bird's eye overview of how we test a tool is we do them at epoch. So an epoch is typically three months long. We do eight weeks of uh, focused testing. And then we do a month where we're curating the reviews, gathering all the information together and um, getting it published on the website. For each epoch, we have something, a role called a tool project manager, and they're leading the way. And we create weekly challenges for each of the tools that we're testing to guide people and make sure we're looking at similar things and testing the different feature, all the important features of a specific tool. So we're, we make sure we're getting like a really good understanding of how it works and what they offer and hitting all of the major points. So it's not like a quick go in and put a proposal through in Colony and let us know what you think. It's eight weeks of like discussion and activity and all of that. So we can really take that deep dive and use it as if we were going to use it as a DAO or an online community. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of like the participants in the epoch, oh gosh, we changed this recently. I think we have between 15 and 16 bounties per epoch for mm -hmm. participants. So 10 of those are written reviews and John likes to call them their like Amazon reviews, but they're not. They're much <laughs> longer and more detailed than that. I always yell at him when he uses that analogy. Um, this is not an Amazon review. It's a more detailed review. And then we have editing roles. We have the tool project manager. And then we do like a TLDR epoch overview summarization. So if you're just looking for the quick se overall sentiment of what, how the testers felt about the tool, you can do that as well, or you can read that as well. So there's lots of opportunities to participate. And yeah, it's been going really well so far. And we've been looking at playing with that model a little bit because some tools are better fit for different models. So mm -hmm. that's something that we're looking at for the future as well. Cool. Maybe John leaves 45 minute reviews on Amazon. Have you seen John E on there? And it's like a diatribe of how this toilet brush was working. Let's do it, man. <laughs> so, in, so in your docs, we actually saw different like levels of contributors, it's like one, two, and three. Can you walk us through what that means, what that looks like? Yeah, for sure. We're following the uh, Bankless DAO model in terms like level one, level two, level three. When you join our Discord, you're just like a watcher. You can see like all of our documents are in there. You can see do a little learning session on the DAO. A level one essentially means that you completed one of the bounties Aaron was looking at before. So essentially, let's say you wanted to write a review on a tool we were testing. You went through the whole epoch, you tested it out. Okay, I know I have a good feeling about how, um, uh, how this tool works and I write my review. For, we use uh, colony.io for like our governance and uh, we use like reputation in that system. It's a really cool system if you haven't tried it. And uh, yeah, but uh, essentially a level one contributor is they've done a review and they've gotten paid in a stable coin and reputation in the DAO. So that's like a member in our mind. And then level two is they've done, I think we have. 
Now, after you've completed one epoch, you can self-nominate to become a level go. two. <laughs> but you just self-nominate yourself to be a level two contributor and say, hey, I'm really interested in participating in this. And then level three is after you've completed uh, three epochs, then you just self-nominate. So proof of participation, I would call it. Like mm -hmm. if you're participating in the DAO, you're earning this reputation. And the cool thing about why we use Colony is that reputation in their system actually decays. So every 90 days, a reputation that you earn for completing a bounty decays. It has a half-life. Aaron talked about the decentralization piece. We intentionally built this DAO. It's very centralized. I think Vitalik has a quote of like extreme dictatorship and then the self naturally decentral decentralizing. That's what we designed this for. So it was like three of us that had reputation. And then as we completed these bounties and as people contribute to it, it's really the test of if a DAO is going to work because our reputation will decay and other people will start to get the power. It's like at, at the heart is we're trying to see if a DAO is going to work. Very interesting. Let's go into how Eli 5 DAO sustains what it does, right? So mm -hmm. what is in traditional terms, what's the business model, right? Like, are you, are you working with these organizations or with these tooling providers and they are sponsoring you to do this? Or are you a grant based uh, mm -hmm. DAO? Give us some insight on and what where you're at right now and then maybe what, where you're planning to grow this to. Yeah, so right now we're a combination of both of the things that you mentioned. So we've had tooling projects and companies sponsor epochs. It's $500 or the equivalent of $500 in stable coins to do that. So we've had a few one, two, three, three. Yeah, I think so. Three yeah. tool out of five sponsor their own epochs. And then the rest of the funds and the rest of our treasury has come from grants that we've either won or been gifted from very kind people who found out what we were doing and wanted to support our mission. We've been lucky. We also just participated in Gitcoin 18, right around 18. So we're excited to see what shakes mm -hmm. out with that with all the matching funds. So yeah, we're primarily grant and grant based. And then that's part of why as We've gotten started with this and taken this path. We've decided to go down the nonprofit route because we want to remain a public good where people can consume the reviews without having to pay. But also we want one of the benefits of that for the people who want to sponsor us or give us grants is that then becomes cool. tax deductible. Thank you. So it's, it's very beneficial for us tax wise, but it's also beneficial for the people who are supporting us to do our work. And just with our educational mission and everything, we, we pretty much from the beginning knew that we weren't looking to do this to be like super profitable and make a ton of money, but more to like for the public good and to help the space grow and progress. Yeah, it's very much like a learning focused thing. This is like trying out a tool, like I said, like a consumer reports of Web3. We're trying this out and then for the good of the people, we hope people are reading their reviews and like actually getting some, in terms of like the contributors, the members that are completing this, these bounties, I think they're going to get, they're almost going to be like really great consultants, like in the space, because they've tried Dow House, they've tried Colony, they've tried Aragon, like all of these tools, and they know the pros and cons of each one. And then they've tried like communication tools and all this kind of stuff. So as the members, it's beneficial. And if they were going to start their own DAO, and then uh, hopefully if people in the DAO or, or let's see other DAO members, maybe not starting their own DAO, but they know, hey, we tried this tool X, Y, and Z, and it, it has pretty good reviews on Eli 5. And yeah, we'll see where it goes. So you're saying, I was trying to look this up right now, and the only thing popped up real fast was... 241.7 million in 2017 is the revenue of consumer reports. I wouldn't say small necessarily, that you're, not, <laughs> that you're not trying to optimize the profit on a personal level, right? Or for the organization, great. But I think something yeah. like that can be pretty big, right? Just to put this into perspective. <laughs> There's some opportunities with like consumer reports. I'm sure, you know, that they do like their subscription model and all that kind of stuff. There's some cool things I think you can go down this route for sure. Yeah, and so you touched on the 501c3 nonprofit status. I was going to ask that question anyway, why you decided to go that way. You answered that pretty well. But maybe give us a bit of insight into your thought process as you are going through this decision-making, because that is a very specific organizational structure for mm -hmm. a DAO. We hear that not very often. 
what is yeah. more common is like an una, right? It's in that right. realm maybe, but like why a five why like a proper quote unquote 501c3 nonprofit organization. I'm going to let John take this, but it's been a journey. We didn't <laughs> land right there right away, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I actually have a, an article of like me going through this journey that I wrote. It's like a four series thing. And yeah, we were going down rabbit holes and essentially, I guess I got to give a shout out to Lex Dow. They've helped us out a lot in this. If you're in the Dow space and don't know about Lex Dow, definitely check them out. They're legal engineers and all that kind of stuff. So just really great people there. Essentially, that was the question that we came up with is, do we incorporate or do we stay unincorporated? And that goes down the the UNA route that you're talking about. Because we are based in the United States, we think that in, in terms of legal conversations, it's very taboo in the DAO space right now. And we just wanted to be upfront about it. I think you can go into our Discord and you can see the research that we've done on this. We have a legal specific channel on that. We've posted all of these articles and all this kind of stuff that we've researched. We are actually an unincorporated nonprofit association. So an UNA, and we actually use Kali.gg for our UNA wrapper. And it's a great tool for those who aren't, I think it was wrapper dot WTF or something like that. You can mint essentially a wrapper for your DAO. So we've used that tool and yeah, it's a great question. I think for the U S base it, if you're an LLC, that wasn't going to be a route for us because that's looked at as a partnership with a partnership that includes tax liabilities that would not allow people to remain anonymous if they wanted to, or if they had that preference, we thought that the UNA route was the best route. And then the UNA and a 501c3, that kind of combination of the two is something that's very rare. I don't think it's in, been in the space that much. And we were actually getting advice to look at 501c6, which is a trade association. To me, that's more of, I see like a DAO coalition or somebody like going down that route. Like maybe they're fighting for or lobbying for specific like regulations in the Web3 space. That's what I see. Because we're like education based, I think we meet that 501c3 kind of mission. Like I said, we're essentially a precedent of consumer reports, which actually, if you look up consumer reports, is a 501c3 on their website. We're doing the exact same thing that they're doing just in the Web3 space for unique tools, not the tactile tools that we're used to in the space. Yeah, it's been a journey for sure. We're actually working with a, I think it's crypto tax guy, and they have offered to do this process for us for essentially, they're doing it for, for the good of the space. And we have been working I don't, I don't even know. <laughs> it's been, oh gosh, almost a year, I think, yeah. when we, because when, when we launched Eli5 is when we started thinking about this stuff because we started getting like grant money and stuff and we're like, how are we accounting for this and yeah. all of that? So we knew it was something that we needed to tackle right away because it takes a lot of time. So it's been, yeah, we're almost coming up on the year mark where we're working together with them. But we might be the only Una pursuing 501c3 ever. We'll see. <laughs> I think that Lexdown might be too for theirs. But yeah, I was very familiar with the LCA Colorado Law as a limited cooperative association. Shout out to Yev and the, the, those groups over there. But when we go to these IRL events, we always go to the legal talk that happens. And you'll always find Aaron and I sitting in the back somewhere <laughs> and raising our hands, like asking all these questions. But yeah, we were going down these routes. What do we do? And there's other options like to incorporate maybe offshores, but I think a lot of the research that we found was like the United States is going to have jurisdiction on this. So it's better to be upfront and just transparent about this, in my opinion. And I think in a lot of the people in the Dow is they are thinking the same thing. Yeah, that's why we're going the 501c3 route. We have articles of association. I want to give a shout out to Song of Dow too. That's the gentleman who creates a song, Song of Day. He was very like innovative in the LCA model and actually put his uh, documents on the webpage. And it was great because that was like when I was early in the space looking at that stuff, it was just great to reference. So if you go into ours, you can see our articles of association, our TUNA, which is the Trustless Unincorporated Nonprofit Association paperwork, and we have the Dow Charter as well. And then I think we have an amendment to a TUNA, but like all the legal stuff that we've been going through, very transparent and like open so everyone can see it. So yeah, absolutely love that. So many shout outs here and many of which yeah, are our friends. <laughs> this is why I love this space, right? Next DAO, episode three, DAO Deep Dives, yes. with Kyle and yeah. Callie, yeah. rapper, all of these words yeah. have come up, right? So for some of the people who have been listening from the beginning, 
if you haven't, go back and listen to all the episodes, of course. But yeah, you will start to see, right, the intimacy of Web3 that still is what we see and feel day to day, even ourselves, right? This is a rough space sometimes. Yeah. This is the beauty of it, right? And then yeah. and then actually going to a conference or two and actually meeting these people. And <laughs> it still is like, it's a worldwide thing, but it's still a small world in a way. I love it. I absolutely love it. Okay. That being said, we get a bit of understanding now on the, again, quote unquote business model here, or at least what you're starting to experiment with, right? Yeah. Are you thinking about a kind of tokenomic backed model for Eli5 DAO itself? Or are you just trying to keep that simple in the way you're describing it with stable in, stable out kind of thing? Or mm -hmm. any thoughts on that? Yeah, this is something we thought a lot about when we were launching the DAO. So we do technically have a coin, but it's locked on Colony. So it's a Eli5 token. It's only used for governance. And we've chosen, at least up to this point, to not open it up onto the market. I think due to the legal ambiguity, especially here in the US, around like securities and tokens and all of that, we wanted to try to avoid some of that potential repercussions that depending on how that all shakes out in the future, which it's starting to come to fruition of how things are getting treated. And there's a lot of unknowns still, a ton of unknowns. And a lot of the big players are starting to feel the impacts of that piece. So we chose not to go that route specifically because it's gray right now. And we didn't want to really something and then it come back and it'd be called a security and then having to deal with all of that and pivot to make ourselves work and fit in within with whatever regulations eventually come to be. So for now, at least for the foreseeable future, I don't anticipate that we're going to be token backed and we're sticking with the stables for payments and everything. Honestly, it's nice because they're, they're pegged $10 is generally $10 and you're getting paid that and you can expect that to be the same when you start the epoch versus when you actually get paid for your work. So that's a benefit as well versus it's something tanks and then you're getting like pennies on the dollar for all this time that you spent. So yeah, we've chosen not to do that right now. It's not to say it could never happen in the future, mm -hmm. but yeah, for now, I think we're sticking with kind of this like cut and dry model just to protect ourselves and see how things shake out and then we can make a more informed decision as to whether that would be something we'd want to consider. So all the people thinking about the token, all the listeners, they just came up for air. And so let's dive back deep into the product itself and think about it from a standpoint of the value that it's bringing. So we can get reviews pretty much anywhere, right? Why would we go to ELI5 versus some of these other review sites or doing research on deepdow.io or just YouTube sort of stuff, right? Like, or how does this fit into someone's research perhaps? No, for sure. We were, Aaron and I were literally at ETH Denver. And as our kind of side project, we were doing research. Is our project actually something that we would do? So I think we interviewed probably, oh. you know, it was like 100 people. 100 angry. Waiting in line at ETH yeah. Denver. Yeah. Angry. People waiting in line because it was so unorganized. But we're okay. like, hey, you want to chat? Yeah. And we come up to them with our iPads and we're like, will you do a survey with us? And this is the alpha from our survey. This is like our, essentially our market research that we were doing. And what we were finding through that is two things. One, the devs did not have good instructions on how to use these protocols. That was one big thing that came out from our research. It's a problem. I'm letting everyone know, okay, if you can find a solution to that, there's a lot of people that are looking for that. A lot of developers that are looking at that, especially at ETH Denver. The number two thing was there wasn't trust in the research and the information on what people were doing. And this is where this idea was born out of. We hope to be the, that, that piece that people can go to. People were getting advice and they didn't know if they can trust that advice. They didn't know if people were in the space. I'm, I'm forgetting like what all the comments were, but we grouped all of these comments and those were the two things that we found. So our goal is to attack that problem based on the market research that we found from ETH Denver, just sitting in and talking to people. And Eli5 was from that. We're doing it in a way that's nonprofit based. I think somebody, we've gotten companies come up to us and ask us like, we want you to research our project, but it's not for educational purposes. Like of the general public, it's just for them. So it's that's like an them. internal, they want us to, to debug their product for them and then give them feedback. 
And that is something that we do want to do in the future, not to digress from the question. Um, but we've actually had to decline at this point because it doesn't meet our nonprofit yes. educational mission where it's a public good. Yeah, it's, I think the need is there. We want to, like John is saying, establish ourselves as that trusted source. You Can, can you trust crypto Twitter at this point? You got people rambling and... I don't know if I can swear in here, but shit, <laughs> shit posting and they're getting paid for this and that. They're all these projects are constantly rugging. It's who can I trust in this space? Hmm. Um, we want to be that trusted resource. And to give the web two equivalent, can you trust Amazon reviews anymore? Because they're all bought. Can you trust Google reviews? Because there's no vetting there. We want people to have in their mind that Eli Five reviews are trusted. They're they're researched. They're there's no question in people's mind when you read that it's an honest review of a product that people actually have been using. So that's really the goal. And mm -hmm. I think it's going to take us a long time to establish that, but we're here for the long haul. Obviously, we wouldn't be doing all of this legal stuff if we weren't planning to be here. So we're willing to put in the work and we definitely have our mascot for Eli5 is a cross between a sloth and a turtle because we really believe that slow and steady approach is going to build this foundation for the future. Very cool. So first of all, yes, you can swear. <laughs> we are too small of a podcast at this time to worry about YouTube demonetizing us. So swear you can come back and bleep that out. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm probably the worst one on the show anyway. There's F-bombs left and right. But Back to the point, I love what you were saying, and I can see your connection to Colony, right? And the reputation part that will all, for anyone who, who who hasn't had any experience with Colony, first go read the Eli 5 preview of it, right? And then you'll yeah. know, know most of it already. <laughs> but the, the, the reputation aspect seems very important there because you're saying it needs to be a trusted review, yeah. right? So you're, the people who work with Eli 5 will eventually have their scorecard, their baseball card, whatever, their on-chain reputation, right? And mm -hmm. that is, I think, a big issue we have generally in the space still, a ge general solution for this. But I love that you're working with that uh, in mind. So just wanted to throw that in there. Another part of that is an L. I know we have our bankless kind of levels, but hey, I was an L3 and Eli 5, I did three epochs. Okay. It's, it's something small right now, but it's okay. I've actually gone through and tested these tools and we can see the comments that person has gone through. It's very transparent and you can go back and be like, okay, this person in Eli 5 actually knows a little bit about Colony, tested X, Y, and Z. Yeah. yeah. And from the tooling perspective, I've actually created this stamp. It says like Eli 5 tested. <laughs> that means nothing right now, but in the future, like that should be a, like a gold star stamp where a tool, a project can be like, hey, we were tested by, we were vetted by Eli5. Like our project's legit. We have a good product, et cetera, et cetera. We hope on both sides of the of that coin that we'll be able to provide substance and I don't know what the word I'm looking yeah. for is. But for me, it's like yeah. feedback. It's like this company wanted feedback from its users and they actually listened to their users. Like I, I teach, sometimes I teach leadership courses and we, the analogy is feedback is a gift. If your grandmother gave you like this ugly Christmas sweater, you're not going to tell grandma that I hate the sweater. Like that that's a gift that she's trying to give to you. The feedback is a gift and the companies that use our reviews and put it into their product not take it like okay they just said everything was bad with our product or it was like it's that gift that they're going to use and that the people are going to appreciate when they use that tool so to me it's like the feedback piece of it yeah good segue so all of us in web3 have a responsibility to really educate right and mm -hmm. i think that the maturity level of this specific space now allows you to throw things out there like the stamp of approval that you were just talking about right and, and I think that we really do have this responsibility to step up, be confident about our knowledge and, and put this sort of thing forward. So hats off to you guys for doing that. I'm quite fond of your mission, right? Which mm -hmm. is to educate through experimentation. Maybe walk us through what that means to you and how you came up with that. Yeah. So we have another shout out to Dow Club. And at the end of there, he's put together this really cool program for Dow's. And we pretty much launched right when we started Dow Club for Eli5. So something that we really talked about and th thought on was our mission and vision statements and our purpose statements and mm -hmm. how we can make that impactful and to the point. As, so that's what we came up with. I think 
it, it opens the opportunity. People know we're not experts here, but we are working with these tools. We want to, like John loves to say, we go in and break the thing, not always on purpose, uh, <laughs> but we truly want to get our hands dirty. This is a, our DAO is a sandbox mm. that allows for that experimentation in a safe way. You're not putting, generally speaking, you're not putting your funds on the line or your project that you've been working so hard on the line for. It's come in, try this out. There's zero stakes here. Like you can get your hands dirty, not worry about it, not worry about losing all your crypto or ruining your project because you made a bad choice or whatever the the, the thing is. So it's bringing it back to that five-year-old, like kids learn best through play and experimentation. And that's what we're trying to do. So I think you've run Epoch Reviews, Colony, Samudai, Common Ground, Dow House. Give us a short summary on these, how your process may have impacted your review of these tools, right? How was that? Yes, we started off with Colony. That was, like we said, based out of the DAO Club. It just made sense if we're going to be using Colony as our governance platform, that we want to make sure that people that are writing these reviews actually know how to use it. So that was like the first thing. And our... also, Colony funded that first epoch for us yeah. and provided additional grant money. So it was a really nice partnership to help us launch um, because yeah. we had not, we, like, we didn't have a treasury. So it was just a great kind of natural fit. And like John said, we were using them for governance anyway. So it made sense that everybody took a deep dive into the tool. Yeah. And then like question comes up like impartiality, like how can you be agnostic or like to that? But Colony was very clear about we don't want, this does not mean anything for us. They took the feedback and literally had meetings with us after and we gave them a list of things that we found. So that was like really great in terms of that. And then that was like our first epoch. And then Sam Udai was around, I think that was about a year, uh, maybe a year ago, but Sam Udai had a grant. It was almost like a grant program for DAOs, but uh, we applied for it and they were like, hey, we would love for you to test our, our product out. And the team was just really great. They actually spoke with us before ETH Denver. We had them on a panel with us in DAO tooling. So just a, a really great team there. And then had a friend recommend uh, Common Ground, which was super cool. Very good group over there too. And then it just flowed in this kind of manner. People heard what we were doing and it just kept growing. Through that time, we actually didn't, there was like probably two or three rounds of Gitcoin that we did not do because we were just flowing based off of recommendations and word of mouth and it's been working its way. So and I will say we've learned a lot from that first epoch to now, like we've changed our model slightly yep. based on how things went and different. We've changed. That's why in the beginning I'm saying I, we're between like 15 and 18 bounties because we recently passed a proposal to change our our, our structure for bounties because we found some of the jobs that we had as separate bounties were extraneous. And then we found we wanted to pay more for the reviewers because they're mm -hmm. spending so much time and it's an in-depth review. It's not just a quick two minute thing. So we've changed our model based on that and redistributed funds and taken some of the bounties off so that we could do that. But yeah, we've definitely modified that. And then we've also revamped our participation guide. And then we're in the process of revamping our light paper as well. So those are all available and being our, our light paper, I think you can view it as a proposal over on Trimverse using their proposal mm -hmm. system where it's pretty cool because you can all collaborate on the same document in real time. So that's just about done as well. And yeah, we, it's, we launched as three people, but we knew in the back of our head that things were going to shift over time because as a DAO grows, there's more opinions and mm -hmm. feedback and the direction shifts with the groups. We were prepared for that and we did the best with the knowledge that we had. And now we're modifying based on the knowledge and the direction that we're moving. Yeah, I love you guys. You you create the perfect segues into every single question. We <laughs> <next. Yeah>. <laughs> because I was going to point out like through this casual conversation, it sounds like when you're you know, talking about these reviews, I want to clarify for our listeners, it's not just a yeah. two of you, right? I think you have 20-ish people contributing right now to these uh, reviews and yes. and you're a DAO so you're growing and you're a relatively young DAO as well yep. so I, I I peeked through your governance page on Colony a little bit some names jumped out at me Drost from Bankless he runs actually another podcast and the P Paxist is on there too he was yep. episode eight I believe on our show Crypto Dad that's probably yep. pretty familiar to many people of our listenership so you're throwing all these names around and getting to the question, basically, how do you think about 
growing the DAO, right? You're talking about kind of word of mouth on the product side. That seems to go uh, be going really well. How are you thinking yep. about your, your contributorship? What's the strategy there right now? Yeah, for sure. We have not put as much attention to this as I think we should in terms of growing the DAO members. We we mentioned our like our mascot, the Slurtle, the slow and steady turtle, <laughs> Slurtle. It's, and chippy. it's a <laughs> nod to the the Buffacorn kind of deal. Yeah, but yeah, we have not been doing as much. I think for us, we're focusing on the we're going to permissionless. We're staying with a, a, a group of people there, and just I think the people that are going to contribute to this are the people that want to learn about the space. Right now, we're in this bear market. So it's really tough, I think, for us. But I think as things maybe change, maybe people will actually want to do this. But yeah. I think in terms of marketing, we haven't been doing anything crazy. Like it's been that word of mouth. Should we be doing more? I think definitely sure we we should be. But I think our members have been like recommending specific people and like being like, hey, you really might be interested in this. I think we're like a very good RN DAO and like talent DAO. Like these are really good I think organizations and that would like what we're doing and maybe even like a tally or something like that in terms of like reviews and stuff. If we're all working together, I think Dow Coalition might be a good one too. But yeah, that's where I'm at. Yeah. I'll add like that was one of the question marks when we launched Eli 5 Dow mm. was like, is anyone going to want to do this? With <laughs> and we did the builder spotlight with Colony where we did interviews like this and we did, I think, four total. Yeah. Um, so we basically we went from zero to one, if we're at one, if we can call ourselves at one now, but from zero to one where we had no one and then it, it's blossomed into this kind of cool thing. So far, we have 18 different contributors that have gone paid for bounties. So I feel like it's pretty good. We also have a ton more watchers. So people that like want to get in on the action and are waiting for those bounties, the next bounties to open up. We uh, have shifted to talking a little bit about this amongst our own community. And again, I think the slow and steady growth is to our benefits. We've had the opportunity to really form relationships with people. Mm. And I also always come back to that like onion model where we have our real core contributors to people that are there every epoch. And then we have some people that have only contributed once or twice. And that's totally fine. The way our model is set up, it's really easy to dip in and out as you want. It's mm -hmm. not like a, a huge commitment beyond the epoch. And we are, but to the point of trying to spread the word, we are doing, we held our first IRL get together at ETH Denver this year. Mm -hmm. And then there's a big group of us going to Permissionless. We're doing our next happy hour. That'll be on September 12th. <laughs> Check out our Twitter page if you want to come. It's an open event. Like we don't charge anyone. We don't have tickets or anything. It's just, hey, come come hang out with us and yeah. network and see what we're all about. So that is happening. And then we're also talking about looking forward possibly next year to ETH Denver about like getting a table and having a more established presence. So that's something we're working towards. Obviously we have a, like our treasury is small. So we have to be mindful of that and make strategic decisions about how we're spreading the word and doing that quote unquote, like marketing to get more people involved. I think another comparison could be like uh, Bankless Consulting, though. Mm -hmm. Like Bankless Consulting is doing, it's very similar to what we're doing in terms of, hey, we're, we're presenting information on these tools that you could use or something like that. So to me, it's very similar to that. And like I said, we're going the nonprofit route, but I think that the people that actually do these reviews, they are going to get the education piece. If you want to learn about Web3, I feel like it's a good opportunity to get your hands dirty and then ask, be that vulnerable piece. I, I want to ask the questions and actually learn about this. And I, I don't care if I'm going to make a fool out of myself. If, a, you know, Aaron has is learn is learning the code. She's got the front end. She's working on back end. But even if you're not a developer in this space, like that's who we hope that eventually starts to use these tools. And those are the people that also matter as well. Yeah, I think for me, this is a great opportunity for people, right? Because we are all doing this, these research due diligence all day, every day, right? The clear opportunity I see for Eli5 here is to provide that platform, the DAO, right? Like that opportunity to monetize your research in a way, right? It, it's not going to get you rich, but hey, if I can make 50 bucks off the research I already did, fantastic, right? Yeah. Right. right. Yeah, very cool. I thought I had here while we were talking. So it seems like you're starting with DAO tooling and the periphery of DAOs, right? Just like we're DAO deep dives, we're about DAOs and contributors and founders, but also the periphery of DAOs. So that makes a lot of sense. But have you thought about doing that about DAOs themselves as well? I think there's a lot more confusion potential in DAOs. <laughs> 
And how awesome would it be to have a, ve a very structured overview of what is a DAO, what is it doing, why does it exist, what's my opportunity yeah. here as a potential interested party? It might be a lot more dynamic. So I don't know. Is that something you, you've thought about? I'll digress for two seconds. We have had companies actually look at us for sprint epochs. Hey, they're putting in a new attribute to a, for a tool and they want to test it out. So we've had that asked of us. But in terms of actually evaluating DAOs to your question, yeah, I don't think we've thought about that for sure. I think it's, it's a very interesting concept in, in itself. Yeah, I, I don't think we've thought about it, but in terms of, hey, this is what the DAO is. And hey, I think that kind of goes into maybe our first project that we were thinking of. But I don't know. What are your thoughts? Yeah, it's a great question. It's not something we've thought of. Yeah. I think it it would have because DAOs are so undefined right now, like we were mm. talking about at the beginning, you'd almost have to do it in like a case by case basis of like a specific DAO or type of DAO, which is still hard to qualify DAOs into these buckets. I like because we do that with our other project. It's what kind of DAO is this? And it's sometimes it's really hard to know. Yeah, I, I, it's an interesting prospect. We have thought about to your point, though, Let's say a DAO, like I have a group of friends that want to do like an investment. We have thought of eventually we want to get all these reviews and like a, a really great spot on the Eli5 uh, site. But hey, I want to start a, an investment DAO. This is actually what we recommend or the top 10 tools for investment DAOs to, to adding to that. But that's all I can think of. Yeah. We love talking about investment DAOs on this show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, almost too much though. We're trying to like, oh, it's an investment DAO. We, we have to wait. Right. <laughs> but maybe uh, this could be a bounty thing. People can uh, review DAOs yeah. and then deliver that. You already have the list, right? Yeah. And for anybody like curious, how many DAOs are actually out there? Decentralist.com list of DAOs uh, is something you could find pretty easily. And oh my God, the list <laughs> on there is pretty incredible. So that could be the list. And then bounties perhaps try to fill that out a little further is I think what Sven was getting at. Let's shift gears for a minute and go yeah. into kind of our fun questions at the end of the episodes, or usually more, <laughs> sure. the more creative ones, right? And I'll kick it off with the division question, right? Mm. You spend so much time thinking about DAOs and, and tooling and everything around it. So from, and feel free to give your individual qu uh, answer to this, where is the space going? Think 10x from now, 100x from now in scale or years. What does the future look like for DAOs? You want to go first or you want me to go first? You can go. He's a dreamer, so he'll have his answers <laughs> real quick. Yeah. When I first started, I thought for me, I'm a sports guy. I was very interested in starting a, a sports DAO. I would love for me, the US, I'm a big soccer fan. So if anyone else is, but the Bundesliga in Germany, where 51%, it's a community owned, community run, and they get the final vote and what the fans get to decide. To me, that's what the DAO space can do. It's the decentralization, it's that democracy piece. I would love to see the 10x, 100x is DAOs owning sports teams, and then those are community owned by cities or X, Y, and Z. That's what I would love to see. That's what got me really intrigued on the space when I first started like the sports arena. I think there's a big, it's a huge opportunity, but it's you're battling essentially the rich in the US to do this. So what it's going to take is it's going to take the people to harness this energy and be like, this is what we want. And I think a DAO can do that. That's my, that was my reason why I got into the space. And I had the pivot to list of DAOs because it was going to be a huge thing. Like the LCA model was something I was researching like probably two or three years back. But uh, yeah, to me, it's a, hey, we own and we uh, run these things and we're the, the cooperatives that are also using technology to, uh, to their advantage. So. So for me, I think I, looking ahead 10, 20 years from now, I would love for DAOs just to be another kind of business model, just a regular alternative mm -hmm. to the business model that most people are used to. I think right now people are very afraid of using the term DAOs and getting their feet wet in DAOs because it's so linked to crypto and people are scared of crypto. So my hope is that as the space continues to progress. There's more adoption. There's more opportunity given to people who are underserved in different communities and areas of the world that those opportunities become more abundant and it's very easy to get involved. I hope that 
gosh, so many hopes and dreams for this space. I think there's still a lot of work to do. I think everyone hates regulation, but it's some it's here in the US, it's something that needs to happen so the space can just move forward. Because right now it's just nobody really knows what this is and nobody wants to touch it because it's not defined and everyone's scared to get involved. I think getting over that hump is going to be huge for the space. Good, bad, ugly. It's something that needs to happen so we can move forward. So yeah, I hope it's something that's just a regular household thing. And one of the greatest, and we alluded to this before you guys did, is one of the coolest things about this space is there is no political or ge geographical boundaries. Like we work and know people all over the world because of this. And that's so cool. When I, like none of our family is involved in what we do, but when I tell them, I'm like, oh yeah, I, have, we are, I was on a Twitter space. We were doing a Twitter space for Gitcoin and the host was Etienne from Colony and he lives in the UK. And they're like, where is he from? I was like, oh, he's in the UK. And that's so cool. Like having the opportunity to connect with people from all over the world whose interests align with you is invaluable and one of the greatest pieces that I'm so thankful for. And it keeps you going in the dark times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, that's the, the rose colored glass vision that I have. <laughs> But what would it be without those? So yeah, that, that's definitely my hope for the future. Yeah, real quick note from my side, and then we we'll get to the last couple of questions. But what you just said, anyone who's listening, please create. You guys all know it. Here is what my mom thinks I do. Here's what my co thinks I do. Can someone create that for DAOs? I would love to see it. <laughs> Speaking of hopes and dreams, I think everybody can agree with what you're saying, Aaron, and I, we definitely all want regulation to come and these things to clear the path so we can really just take off, right? And be as creative as we want while also respecting individual laws of individual places because we are a worldwide mm -hmm. collective of people all working towards something. And then John, with what you mentioned, you're obviously a fan of Krause House probably, which has come up on several shows. And I think one of the first times we heard it was an answer to our next question, which is, what do you think is the craziest idea that should be a DAO or could be a DAO at some point? It can't be an existing DAO. <laughs> There's no rules, so. Crazy in a good way. Let's preface. Uh, Go yeah, ahead. Crazy in a good way. I So we, okay, list of DAOs, talking a separate project outside of Eli5. We've had some crazy DAOs. One of them was to buy Michael Jordan's old house. I love the idea. <laughs> did not raise the money, obviously. Did not, could not do it. But I just love the like the dream and the vision of that. And it was just like, we're going to buy Michael Jordan's house. And I was like, all right. They say they're going the DAO route. But I guess crazy. When we first got into the space, Moondow was like a crazy idea. Okay, they're going to send someone up to space. Okay, yeah, sure whatever but they ended up doing it and it's okay i'm gonna give uh i guess my answer to this question though is i like the unique and the creative ones wasabi we mentioned wasabi is a good friend of ours making a coconut farm in the dominican republic i love it it's a crazy unique idea and i have it's almost like when you're gonna buy a car and you start noticing the car i've noticed so many like coconut drinks and like all these things i'm like man this guy is actually on to something and he's going to do this. And he is like all about Dow House and all the really into it. He's a great role model and a great mentor in this space. And I really think he's going to do this thing. Well, he's like, doing it. Yeah, he's yeah, doing it. He's by, like I think it's, doing it. <laughs> I think he's going to make a coconut farm and it's going to be on the blockchain. It's going to be crazy. That's my answer. <laughs> so his prod, his DAO is Coconut DAO and his bigger project is Coconut. And, yeah, Coconut um, Network. Yeah. So, coconut yeah. Network. So if you're interested, definitely check him out. Yeah. I So the first thing that came to mind was all like the space related DAOs. I think it's a really neat use case. So like obviously Moon DAO, but there's more out there. If you could check out like the D side tag on list of DAOs, there's a ton that come up like mining minerals and there's all kinds of like really what a general person would say like out there ideas but i think rallying support and community around an idea it can be really powerful and i think not every venture is going to be successful <laughs> but the one sometimes it surprises you and they are and i think that's like the coolest moment in this it, like when you find out about these projects and then they actually meet like their mission you're just like it warms your heart you're just like that's amazing and yeah. i'm so proud to be in the space with them because that's it's so cool so I mean, look at constitution dow right look yeah, at the history cool. of like yeah. what we have and like yeah <laughs> 
Constitution Dow heavy hitter on this show comes up almost every episode. And what would we be without another shout out from the folks that created a list of Dows? There's obviously plenty of opportunities for those. So shout out to Moon Dow. <laughs> Might see something about that. We're engaged there a bit. So right. that would be a lot of fun. We look forward to that. So what did we not talk about that you wanted to get to? I want to bring this type of thing up on the show. What's interesting to you guys in the space in general? What do you want to riff on for a moment? Yeah, good question. I feel like this has been coming up a lot um, recently. Is I got asked at East Denver, oh, it's like somebody was doing a survey when we were doing surveys and we did our surveys on each other. <laughs> and they were like, what do you think is going to be the trend this year in crypto and the Web3 space? And obviously, maybe not obviously, but I said, I think it's the year of identity. And I think there's some really neat projects mm -hmm. coming out, zero knowledge proofs and dif different ways to prove identity, not only identity, but reputation in the space, like we've talked about a lot in this episode. I'm really excited to see what comes of some of these ventures. And I think that is a huge piece to the puzzle of pushing these decentralized organizations and communities forward is figuring out those foundational pieces of in a space where it's great to be anonymous if you want to be like, how do you vet people? How do you trust people? How do you trust that people are who they say they are? So I think that's a really, I'm excited because there's a lot of people working on it. And I think it's something that is going to be continuing to develop here in the next couple of years. Yeah, I'm like hesitant to say any company or like anything like that because I don't want to do shout outs. But I love think, name dropping. Go no, ahead. Like, You've been doing the, it the whole time. It's the tools. <laughs> it's the tools. I think like I when you were talking, like I was thinking Bright ID, Proof of Humanity, like those tools that you know, Chess announced. Man, that's a toughie for me. I think, I, I don't know, I feel like uh, my mind is just like cloudy with like all the history of it and just like all over the place. I'm really interested. I thought Good Morning News, I think they stepped down, but I really love their model. Maybe Rug Radio is similar, but these dynamic NFTs, I think it could be something still. One of the Dow Founders pub was just like a real, he's a, he's a spectacular developer front end and back end. But what he was doing, and there's a couple of bankless memo, bank, bankless members, sorry, <laughs> members, <laughs> Hero and uh, True Capital, essentially, and I, and I was participating in this too, is that we were putting out a news article every single day and updating the NFT. And it was like this dynamic NFT, you'd update the metadata, get like the news article in the Web3 space. And to me, I just love that idea of a lifetime subscription to something you buy once and you're constantly getting benefit from it. And I just thought it was like a great idea. A lot of this stuff is, okay, maybe news is not the best case scenario, but I just think there's a lot of opportunity in that I see. So I know NFTs are hurting right now, but I think that there could be some really unique use cases for that kind of stuff that offer some people just maybe if you're in a country where you can't afford news every day, like you have this NFT and you're getting that lifetime. Or you're not getting reliable, unbiased news or there's so many barriers out there. Like we come from a privileged point of view where we can listen to 10 different news people if we want to, but some people, it's very regimented. But I actually think the daily newspaper is the perfect use case. For, so I'm going to disagree with you. <laughs> oh man, attention. I think it's awesome, man. I think what a challenge that is clearing up the news, right? Mm -hmm. That's, that's wild. In fact, there was like an event in Austin one year and they put out like a request for proposals of just if you have a solution using a DAO in regards to news and like clearing that up, it was like actually something they invited people to come speak at South by Southwest up and right. I put something forth, never heard back. <laughs> what must have been that good? I need to jump on that. I'm trying to get him on the show. I never met him actually, but there's a guy living off grid, building off grid here, like two miles from me. And he is the founder of Journal. Uh, yeah, I was doing, yeah. Journal Dow is doing something similar. Yeah, so he lives up the road and oh, he's wow. like an off grid guy like me, right? Super cool. Wow. <laughs> the guys at Journal Dow are great. I like went to one of their meetings maybe two years ago and yeah, just like really great people. And then super uh, inspiring. Yeah. Right? Yeah. All right. So obviously we'll put this sort of stuff in the show notes too. I just want to tell you guys we had a absolutely great time with you. It was super fun. Thanks. So, how can people get a hold of you? Yeah, so we have lots of different ways. So for Eli5, if you go to our website, eli5dow.com, you can get a link to all of our social channels, Twitter, Discord, all of our platforms we use, Colony, Charmverse. Uh, we have a snapshot that we don't use super often, but it's there. And then you can also access the reviews there if you're interested. 
And then we're also on Twitter. So at Eli five down and then five is the number five for all of those things. And then personally, I am Aaron at the Decentralized Diary. My handle is at Decentra Diary. Thanks a lot. Character limit. And in Discord, I'm just Aaron R. I'm one in the same. Most people don't realize that I'm the same person because I need to work on that. <laughs> and then, yeah, Atlas of Dallas is probably the best one that I used to go by. And then my chippy, my personal is just at John E. I have a couple underscores under there, but I'm the chippy with the coconuts on it. The Patsy from the shout out to the Monty Python uh, <laughs> old days. But uh, yeah, that's where we can find us. And then our project that we do, the other stuff is just decentralist.com. So yeah, we're just there and Ron Lenz and yeah, I think a couple others, but. Aaron, John, this has been fantastic. Learned a lot. I'm sure we'll learn even more from all of the cool things you're doing here going forward. I can't wait to read all of that because anything that saves us time, especially in this world, is literally money. So thank you so much for doing the good work and for coming on the show. We had a blast. Thanks again. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thank you so much. See you later. And that's a wrap. Sven and Solver, your host for Dow Deep Dives, a podcast about all things Dow. Thanks for tuning in. Till next time.